options um, ranging from Nexplanon implants to IUDs to sterilization, both male and female. Um, and they have a pretty low failure rate. This is um, per 100 women years, so it's less than two. And you know, for most of us, we're doing cell pingectomy. It's probably less than that. Um, just I haven't seen any new data that that has, you know, kind of written up a big study about the failure rate. It probably hasn't been enough time since we started kind of routinely doing bilateral cell pingectomy. But I bet in the next decade that info will be out. Then very effective is the kind of standard ones that most people think about with pills or patches or NuvaRing or Depo injections. Uh, you know, clearly they, there is the option of um, lactational uh, contraception for, pay, for women who continue to breastfeed postpartum. But, you know, I think William says up to like 20% of women, even when you're breastfeeding, might start ovulating at three months. So it always makes me a little nervous to just have women use that alone. Um, when they uh, could potentially be like one in five women might, might be ovulating and might uh, get pregnant again. So just think about that as you're kind of discussing those options. And then, you know, the, the, the third uh, row here typically revolve around barrier methods. So both male and female condoms, diaphragms, uh, fertility awareness methods. So clearly if a woman has regular cycles that can be utilized. But again, there's about a 10 to 20 uh, per 100 women will fail with that in a year. So it's, um, so it's a little bit uh, less effective. And then spermicides um, or kind of uh, foam are also not very useful, but certainly I guess if they're not using anything versus using that and say maybe their fertility awareness methods, some women can have some fairly decent success. So this is just another picture, same thing. The thing I like about this picture is that it really shows all of the failure rates kind of going across at the top here. Um, I, I remember uh, one of the residents was counseling about, um, this was a few years back, about vasectomy or sterilization versus the um, Nexplanon and the patient when I went to chat with her was was saying oh well why would I get my tubes tied when the implant is clearly much more effective and has a lower failure rate and while that may be true based on you know some of the data that we have you know ultimately you have to remember that depending on her age I mean she may need to get you know 10 more Nexplanons before her fertility years are done. And so it's also important to think about that aspect um, when you're counseling, not only just focusing on the failure rate. Let's see here. So this is a nice slide um, looking at um, pregnancy related deaths. This also came from um, Williams. And, you know, the thing I wanted to highlight here was that, you know, pregnancy even though for most women it's quite safe, you know, there can be an increased um, rate of death as women age here going from, you know, 15 years all the way up to 44 years. Um, I, I talk about this slide every year and then I kind of go through all these other types of birth control and how they are very, very low likelihood of a woman dying from something potentially related to, you know, the type of contraception they use. And then I always get to the um, abortion slide, and, I, and I'm not sure how to explain the 13.4 uh, comparison as it is with pregnancy, because from all the other literature that we have on abortion, it is much safer. Um, but this is just one small study, so I wouldn't by any means have you guys have the takeaway point as the mortality rate is the same for women with pregnancies and abortion between that age range. Um, the patient population could have been a little bit sicker. They may have been further along in their pregnancy, which, you know, as we know, the risks of an abortion do go up as um, the gestation in weeks goes up. But um, I, I still can't fully explain why that, but for everywhere else, you know, clearly it's um, much lower um, in the abortion category. So the medical eligibility criteria is put out by the World Health Organization, which as all of you guys know, uh, due to our fearless leader, we're gonna be 
getting out of the World Health Organization, which I think <laughs> is a terrible move. And hopefully, because it's going to be not going into effect two years from now, we'll get that reversed so we can continue to work with our colleagues in the entire world on improving health for women. Sorry for my soapbox. It's also with the CDC, though, so hopefully the next Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, just so you guys know, the, the upper levels know this already, but the way that they categorize contraception is um, numbers one, two, three, and four. And when we're thinking about all these options, one, it means it's safe for anybody and there's no restrictions. Two means the benefits generally outweigh any potential risks. Three is kind of the opposite of that, where the theoretical risks, either they're proven or not, typically you're going to want to pause and probably try and pick something else if you can. Um, but if there's no other options, pregnancy is probably more dangerous, so it's certainly something you could consider. And then four is, you know, the um, risks are certainly unacceptable and you should definitely not use it. And this would be uh, very, very highly frowned upon and potentially if you did it a number of times, probably could use your license for malpractice if you're prescribing a four type of contraception for women who should not have it. Yes. And so this is that um, uh, circular uh, ring that I kind of usually get, show you guys. Um, when I was a resident, we got these somehow, and then you, know, you could just slide it around. Um, and there's a little cutout here where you kind of match up whatever medical problem they have. You can see here they have things like PID current, you know, sepsis post-abortion, they have diabetes, they have cardiovascular disease, venous thromboembolism, and then based on, you know, going in toward the middle of the circle, you can kind of see which type of birth control matches up with which number of that medical eligibility criteria is. And so, you know, for the most part, um, you know, we think about things like, you know, poorly controlled hypertension, um, really you shouldn't be giving them anything with estrogen because of the potential increased risk for cardiovascular disease. A lot of us shy away from it when they have mild range blood pressures and rightfully so because um, that's listed as a, sorry, I'm trying to bring up this pointer again, but oh, there it is. It's listed as a three for combined hormonal contraception. So like the, the combined birth control pills, the NuvaRing, um, or uh, the patch, you know, it's listed as a level three. So you should try and, you know, pick something else if you can. Um, certainly when women have, you know, current PID, you know, we really shouldn't be putting in any type of IUDs just given the risk for potential um, sepsis and um, worsening of that condition. Now, if they are diagnosed with PID while the IUD is in place, um, that's a little bit different, and we typically feel comfortable treating through that as long as the patient isn't too unstable or septic or they don't have a really large tubo ovarian abscess. So that one is a little bit more um, clear cut for what we should do. So just something I think is interesting to just keep in your back pocket if you're ever kind of wondering. They also have a really large table that um, you can get from the CDC. And um, I think one of those is posted on the lavender side in the office I typically sit at by where the nurse's desk is, but you can also get it online very easily. There's okay, so I'm gonna, uh, questions? Nope, I just said there's an app. Oh yeah, the app. <laughs> So uh, I'll just dive right into talking about the different types of contraception and, and the, the lecture will kind of go with which of these are um, you know, most effective. So as, as of now, I'm, I'm sure everyone's heard of intrauterine devices. Um, the pictures shown here show a levonorgestrel IUD and the Paragard IUD. And uh, you know, I typically tell women, you know, they're about the size of a quarter, so they're pretty small. Um, they, Different types are um, as follows. We have Mirena, which is about 20 micrograms per day. So it's a 52 milligram total IUD. And as of now, it's, it, it lasts for five years, although there is literature saying it probably lasts for more likely seven years. Um, the way it works is it typically causes atrophy or thinning of the endometrial lining, thickens the mucus, and also 
sometimes can inhibit ovulation, but that's by no means the main mechanism of its action. So um, these are contraindications, mostly from Williams. So clearly, if they're pregnant, uh, you know, that's a no-go. Um, cavity distortion. So pretty much what they mean is if someone has like a septate uterus or if they have a very large submucosal fibroid, then I pause about, you know, placing that. Sometimes women have these in the past uh, before they've ever even had like an ultrasound or something and they say, oh, my body rejected it, it pushed it out. And then I find out later that, oh yeah, they had a three centimeter submucosal fibroid. So, you know, they're a little leery sometimes of trying it again, but if you talk to them about you know, removing that distorting factor, then it, it may work well for them. Um, acute PID, so endometritis within three months, you know, I think that's where a lot of us kind of get our recommendation for any type of vaginal STD. Um, I, again, I don't know what everybody else does, but certainly if someone has a new diagnosis of chlamydia, I'm, pretty leery about putting the IUD in if I know that it's there. Now, every once in a while, they don't have a screen, and then I screen them and put the IUD in the same day, and then it comes back a couple of days later with chlamydia or gonorrhea or something. I don't take the IUD back out. I certainly treat them and give them precautions, but um, whenever they have some sort of STD, I'm a little less excited about putting it in place if I can convince them to use something else for a few months and have them come back and have a negative test of cure, that typically makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, <clears throat> they talk about cervical neoplasia. So the big thing here is, you know, if you're thinking that you might have to do a leap procedure, um, as, as you guys know, it's pretty hard to avoid cutting the strings when you do a leap. So I think that's part of the theory. The other part is they probably want you to get that treated and um, and then maybe, you know, you could, if you're doing that, potentially put in an IUD at the same time as that treatment. But the last bit is if they have high-grade dysplasia, as we know, they, they do have a small risk of having underlying squamous cell carcinoma. So then, you know, you would be considering a hysterectomy. And so then, you know, what was kind of the point of putting in an IUD? So I think that's, they just want you to pause and think about it. If it's like CIN1, I don't think that's what they're talking about because women still need reliable contraception even when they have abnormal pap smears. Um, abnormal bleeding of unknown etiology. So that's clearly just trying to get you to remember if you're concerned that they could have hyperplasia or malignancy, you should probably diagnose that before you put in an IUD to treat um, undiagnosed abnormal uterine bleeding. Prior ectopic is the one that I always kind of uh, somewhat uh, take a little bit of a grain of salt with because I think even though we do know that if a woman fails with an IUD in place, their risk for an ectopic increases, I still think it's reliable enough and that risk is lower than if they weren't pregnant or if they didn't use any contraception. I still consider using it in women who have had an ectopic. Well, I don't know if you do the same, Callie, but um, that's kind of my take on that. Um, and then breast cancer, again, this is always a little bit debatable. Uh, Molly probably knows more than she ever cared to know about that. But um, for the time being, it's probably reasonably safe to use like a Mirena IUD in a woman who has breast cancer or history. Um, and the, you know, final word is still kind of being looked into as some uh, hemonks have a pretty um, strong feelings against any types of hormones, whereas others kind of realize the risk of them getting recurrence from a Mirena or some sort of um, progesterone-based IUD is probably quite low. All right, so these are the three types of um, hormonal IUDs aside from Mirena. So Liletta, this kind of came out, I think, about a year ago, where that one's been approved now for six years. So their their uh, marketing strategy is it's the uh, most FDA approved, longest acting uh, progesterone IUD and the cheapest. Um, it is quite inexpensive. And the only thing different between that and the Skyla and the Kylina in terms of um, the 
device itself is the inserting uh, mechanism is just a little bit different with Liletta. Um, whereas Skyla, Kylina are all like Morena, where you have the introducing device with the little um, pullback lever that, that inserts it into the uterus. The hormone doses are quite low for all of these. The duration is lowest for Skyla at three years and Kylina's five years. I think my personal bias is probably the Skyla is not very useful. I, I appreciate that. I know some women like to have a period and I think that Skyla has the most likely chance of that happening, but with the hormone dose being so similar, I think probably the, the, the amount of women who have, you know, regular periods is going to be probably pretty close. Plus you get five extra years or five years total with Kylina. So that's two more years than otherwise, you know, they would have gotten. So certainly something to think about in your counseling. Now, the size of the IUDs, I just put this new picture on. Ky Skyla and Kylina are the exact same size. So they're 28 millimeters wide by 30 millimeters um, long. And Paragard and Morena are both 32 by 32. So, you know, the, the size isn't a huge different, but there was some research done with 3D ultrasound saying that you know, nulliparous women, their uterine cavities were more on the order of the size of the Skyla and the Kylina. So certainly something to think about. That doesn't mean that you can't put a Moreno or a Paragard in a nulliparous woman. It just means, you know, if they are um, counseled thoroughly and you decide, you know, whatever one's best, just uh, the Skyla and the Kylina tend to be a bit smaller and, and potentially fit a little bit better inside the uterus cavity for them. So copper um, T380A, also called Paragard. Right now it's approved for 10 years. However, there's data in various studies that shows it probably works all the way up to 20 years. And that's because it's not like the copper kind of runs out. Now, sometimes it can become oxidized. And I had a patient who I saw about a year ago who had one put in at a different country, you know, 20 years ago, and the strings weren't visible and she left it. And when we took that IUD out, it was multicolored and, you know, looked uh, like it had been quite oxidized, which I imagine probably reduces the effectiveness. Nonetheless, she didn't get pregnant during that whole time. Um, but how it works is it creates an inflammatory reaction and that pretty much just kind of tries to kill sperm. And it also irritates the lining and that inflammation kind of uh, would prevent any type of, um, uh, you know, formation of a pregnancy. It doesn't, um, it's not an, a, uh, it doesn't cause abortion. So some people, you know, uh, try and play it off as that, but, um, it's, it's, it's not something that can cause an abortion. However, it is very useful for um, uh, emergency contraception. So if a woman has unprotected sex and you see her within a few days, you know, then you can place that instead of considering something like plan B. So uh, Paragard contraindications are pretty similar um, the only added ones are clearly Wilson's disease and if they had an allergy to it. Um, although that's somewhat debated as well because, you know, it's, it's hard to know if, if um, these copper allergies are actually legitimate or if it's just they had irregular bleeding and discharge because they had a new um, uh, IUD placed and the, in the kind of just upsets the normal milieu of the vaginal area if they have kind of prolonged bleeding um, symptoms. So otherwise pretty similar with cavity distortion, acute PID, endometritis, um, you know, certainly malignancy or undiagnosed AUB, although this won't treat undiagnosed AUB and in fact it might worsen it, but um, still the same thing you should be thoughtful about placing it before uh, if you haven't done a good workup. So what we do know is that there's no increased risk for pelvic infection with an IUD. Although if women, you know, get an STD, they are at a slightly increased risk of PID, which is kind of what you see on all the TV commercials. 
Again, if they have PID, you don't need to remove it. In general, if they have a sizable TOA, I tend to remove it. I think everybody's a little bit different, but my feeling is if they have a large TOA, I kind of want to remove foreign bodies um, because it can be sometimes fairly difficult to treat these TOAs if there's still a nidus for an infection going on. I do think sometimes you could, if you, if you can't like drain a TOA or you're not going to, you know, um, treat it surgically, sometimes I'll even send the IUD and see if they can do some sort of micro on it to see if there's a culprit to make sure we're treating the right thing in addition to the other STD testing. Actinomyces is one of those things that comes up um, that you usually you get it on a pap smear report and the management strategies as you can see here at the bottom range from doing nothing to removing the IUD and doing antibiotics. I would say in my practice when I find this on a pap smear, I typically just tell women to monitor their symptoms because there's really no strong data that says it significantly increases their risk for PID. I think there was just a few case reports and then people started saying, oh, what should we do with actinomyces? So I would typically, um, you know, just have them monitor the symptoms. Now, if they're having symptoms, fever, pelvic pain, abnormal discharge, then I might more strongly consider removing it or treating them with antibiotics. But if it's just found on a pap smear and they're asymptomatic, I just tend to tell them to watch their symptoms. So expulsion rates for IUDs, actually they're pretty similar between nulliparous and multiparous women, but more nulliparous women request removal, likely secondary to discomfort. And this data is a little bit old, so this is kind of when we were more so just using you know, Mirena and Paragard, which again are a little bit bigger than some of the newer IUDs. So this could, could be uh, potentially decreased in the future as more women uh, likely choose a smaller IUD. But there is a really high continuation rate, as you can see here, about 70 to 90% of women are happy with it and keep it, you know, for more than a year. And kind of as we know already postpartum, which has become thankfully a more common, a commonly offered mode of contraception, um, you can also place it right after you treat a miscarriage or after women have an abortion. Um, the expulsion rate is just a little bit higher, but, but, but nothing as compared to like when we do it postpartum, um, where we know that rate can range from probably 15 to 25 percent. Um, once a IUD is placed immediately postpartum. So just keep that in mind, you know, if you're ever, if someone has like a, you know, seven, eight, nine week miscarriage and you're doing a DNC, um, always remember to talk about contraception because if an IUD is something they want, you know, that would be a perfect time to place it for them. So changes, as most of you guys know, uh, and there's <coughs> varying statistics based on different articles. So None of these are the absolute, you know, what I would say is the bottom line, I guess. But typically in general with Paragard, and you should definitely counsel women about this, they are, they have an increased risk of having, you know, dysmenorrhea, heavier and potentially more prolonged periods, and also uh, potentially with that decreased hemoglobin levels. And so, you know, when women, that's why it's really important to have a really good menstrual history. If they say, oh, my periods are really heavy and they last seven days and they're really crampy, I would tend to shy away from the Paragard just because it's probably going to make that worse and they're going to most likely request for it to be removed. With Mirena, as we know, there's typically this irregular bleeding patterns, particularly in the first three to six months. But amenorrhea rates vary um, by years, and there's, again, different quotes. This is just the one from Williams where they say about 30% have amenorrhea by two years. And if you continue to uh, remove and replace your IUD, about 60% will have amenorrhea by 12 years. And I think, you know, the amenorrhea rate varies. But certainly that's a big thing to talk about when you're counseling is that your periods may may stop. And that for some women can be very unsettling. And if you didn't tell them that, um, they can certainly be quite anxious about that. So uh, 
Expulsion, about 5% is what most of the literature says in the first year. And believe it or not, most of that occurs within the first month. So pretty much if you make it out after a month of them having it in, it's very unlikely that they're going to get expulsed. Um, perforations, one in a thousand, that's certainly something I counsel women on when I'm placing it, when I'm getting their consent. And IUD checks, certainly this can be, you know, the practice patterns vary by providers. Um, you know, if they can digitally feel the strings, it's totally reasonable for them to just do the IUD checks by themselves, particularly in the, you know, COVID era where, you know, we're trying to minimize uh, visits as much as we can. I think this is totally reasonable. Um, another way which I think can be helpful for some women um, if they're a little bit nervous about it or just to build rapport with your patient is having them come back, you know, in four to six weeks to get an IUD string check where you just visually look with a speculum and make sure the strings are about the same length. And certainly if you look during a string check or during any other type of visit and you can't see the IUD strings, then uh, potentially the differential is it fell out, um, the string somehow got shortened or curled up inside the uterus, or it perforated and it's inside their abdomen. So there's a couple of ways you can kind of look for the strings or, or rather feel with the cyto brush or, you know, an IUD hook, sorry, the picture's a little bit off, or this is a forceps that you can sometimes use to um, remove it. But certainly, I would always consider doing a pregnancy test if their IUD strings are missing because they could have certainly been without contraception and been sexually active. So knowing pregnancy status is important. If you can't identify the strings with those kind of quick methods, then typically, you know, the first step that most of us do is getting a transvaginal ultrasound. And if the IUD is in the correct position, but the strings aren't visible, it's certainly reasonable to live, leave it in place until the end of its uh, effectiveness duration and then talk about you know, removal and figure that out at that point. If the ultrasound doesn't show anything and the patient's not sure that they saw it come out, then I would always revert next to getting a abdominal x-ray to see and make sure that it's not in the abdomen. And there's one case that I can recall a few years back where someone had an ultrasound from an outside provider that said they didn't see an IUD in the uterus. Then someone got an x-ray and it said it was in the pelvis. So this person actually did a laparoscopy and couldn't find the IUD anywhere in the abdomen and then ended up doing a hysteroscopy and saw that the IUD was in the uterus. So, um, so the patient, unfortunately, she unnecessarily got a laparoscopy, but the, the moral of me telling you that is, I would always, if you can't see the pictures yourself, it's never unreasonable to repeat the ultrasound so you can, or do it in the office or whatnot. And that doesn't happen very often. Radiologists are very good um, nearly all the time, but certainly just something to be mindful of when patients are coming in from outside referrals and you can't actually review the data except for a piece of paper with some writing on it. And then if you can't, if the patient wants it out and you can't get the IUD strings out, you know, blindly, then typically a hysteroscopy is what most of us revert to. So what about early pregnancy? Um, so if you've confirmed that they have a pregnancy with a positive pregnancy test and they have an IUD in place, Typically, um, up to 14 weeks, the IUD tail can be seen. So I always recommend that if the IUD strings can be seen, that, that it should be removed. And that's because you reduce their risk of all of these things here, which are quite scary with late abortion, sepsis, preterm birth. Um, and, you know, there is a small risk that removing it could certainly cause a miscarriage, but, but certainly you know, I think the risks of leaving it in place outweigh any of those um, uh, small risks of causing a miscarriage. And, you know, there's this really old study that I put on here just for historical purposes mainly, but they said, you know, there was up to a 50% miscarriage rate when the IUD was left in place. And again, this is old. I don't think 25% of women 
you know, have a miscarriage when we remove it these days. But just kind of goes to show you that there is some historical data supporting that it should be removed as well. And then this is another table from Williams, kind of just showing you in a table form those risks. You know, certainly with the IUD left in place in this column and the IUD removed, comparing it to women who didn't have an IUD. And you can see that when you leave the IUD in place, they had a significantly high risk of preterm birth, choreo, abruption. Um, I'm not sure why previa, but you know, potentially maybe the IUD inhibited the placenta from you know, going normally. Um, so just some things to think about as you kind of go through that. All right, so, all right, I already talked about that. Let's see. So uh, again, just kind of reviewing this quickly, a lot of people get concerned about, you know, this ectopic pregnancy risk when you talk to them about it, because you do have to tell them that, um, you know, certainly having uh, a failure of an IUD, their, their risk for getting an ectopic is increased, but compared to people who aren't using any contraception, the absolute number of ectopics is probably reduced to like half of what, uh, uh, woman not using any contraception would be. And again, this is just the manufacturers that talk about prior ectopics. So I think in kind of real life clinical settings, you have to, like everything, weigh the potential risks and benefits. And if, you know, they're really unreliable with other types of contraception and they want this, I wouldn't hesitate uh, to, to allow them to have an IUD um, for birth control. So, um, Again, we can certainly do immediate postpartum insertion. There are some people who do it as soon as two weeks postpartum, but most of us either do it immediately after or six weeks postpartum when there's complete uterine involution. So there are different ways to approach this. Um, I think you know two weeks postpartum is probably a little inconvenient, um, just you know for for new families or new mothers, or you know it's just hard to get out of the house sometimes. So if you can do it right away after delivery, otherwise, you know, hopefully abstinence can work until that six week visit when they're kind of a little bit more mobile and, and pretty well healed from their delivery. So I just wanted to review the insertion just a little bit with these pictures, mostly for the new interns. And also though some of the upper levels, I don't think we place a whole lot of paraguards. So I don't think a whole lot of people would, would classify themselves as having an abundant amount of experience with Paragard. But um, pretty much there's a plastic tube that the IUD, you have to put it into. And that's why you have to wear sterile gloves when you do this, because you actually have to touch the IUD to load it into the tube. And you just kind of push the stem in a little bit and then push the arms down and tuck them into that tube. And then if you sound their uterus, you know where to put this little flange at, and then you kind of just place it in after you've you know, put on your tenaculum. And when you get to the top, um, connected to this tube, there's a little white tube inside the clear plastic tube. And when you get to the top, you hold the um, white inserted tube, which you can kind of see here, uh, right here. You hold that steady and you pull the clear plastic tube or straw, as I call it, backwards while keeping the IUD right at the fundus because unlike the IUD with Mirena where the arms kind of poke up and out, the Paragard arms come up from the bottom and then settle. So, so if you pull back a centimeter, you're actually going to leave the IUD a little bit um, lower in the uterus, which is suboptimal, particularly when position matters quite a bit for the Paragard. So we can go through that in a model. If that doesn't make sense, I'm happy to do that in clinic. Uh, again, Morena's got this really lovely insertion device. And um, again, you kind of, you know, I always say a centimeter. This says one and a half centimeters. Um, somewhere around there, you, you put your flange at how, you can either do it how the uterus sounds, how deep the uterus sounds, or some people will move it that one and a half centimeters. So they just put the flange right up to the cervix and then release it. But the problem with that is when you release the IUD, I always gently kind of push 
the whole device up again to make sure that those arms are right up at the fundus. As you can kind of see in this picture C, once they've kind of released those IUD arms out um, and they've pulled that um, wheel all the way back here, or the slider, then they gently advance the whole device superiorly to push that IUD up at the top. And I usually hold it there for about five or 10 seconds to make sure that it kind of settles in. And then I just remove the whole, whole device. So next planon is the um, etonogestural rod. This certainly um, is radio opaque as we have now probably most of us experienced. Sometimes they are placed a little deep or women have them in for many years and potentially gain weight and they're really difficult to feel at the superficial skin edge where they should be. So you can always get an x-ray to find its location. Um, in my experience, I typically then refer them to Joe Sullivan, one of our general surgeons. He probably does the vast majority of these really deep next one on removals and he just uses a C-arm to, to guide him. I don't know if any of my partners do really deep next line removals. If I can't feel it and I don't think I have a realistic chance, then I get a little nervous about the deep um, neurovascular uh, structures in the arm. And I would much rather have somebody who probably has a little bit more expertise. Yeah. Um, but anyways, this um, similar to, you know, the Mirena increases um, atrophy, mucus, and then and can cause ovulation suppression. It lasts for three years. You know, the big things here are it has irregular bleeding, and that's pretty common. Um, unfortunately, it's more common than not for women, so really important to counsel women on that, because if not, you know, they're going to probably ask for it to be out within a month, and um, ideally, you know, we keep them, keep them in for longer than that. I... I know that you guys all know this, but certainly they updated, you know, the next plan on insertion uh, technique about a year or two ago, whereby we used to just feel right on the medial epicondyle here and measure eight to 10 centimeters medially in that um, sulcal groove. But now you feel for that sulcal groove between the biceps and the triceps and actually go about three to five centimeters below that. And then, you know, that's where you kind of place your, your marking point. And then, you know, how you enter is you, you clearly, you keep it about 30 degrees to just pierce through the skin. And then once you're through the skin, you tent up and kind of um, move it along that uh, skin edge to keep it very superficial. And then once you've gotten all the way to the hub right here, then and only then can you pull back that trigger to release the device in the arm. If you if you stop, you know, like three quarters of the way and you do the trigger too early, then the IUD will poke out of the skin and it's not really salvageable. You can't really like just push it in and hide it. And you clearly, you can't leave it sticking out. <laughs> um, and put a Band-Aid over it or something. <laughs> or I'm sure Andrew would probably do like two, two things, a Dermabond or something, but. <laughs> yep. But all right, so moving on to permanent birth control. You know, these are, uh, in many ways, this is a historical slide. Uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, you know, we, and it's unfortunate, I think I did at least one of all of these in residency, but I think most of you guys have probably been mostly on the salpingectomy train, which I, I think is personally a good thing. I, I'm, I'm not sad that we don't have all of these other ones, um, but we used to just cauterize with like a monopolar, we, a Kleppinger is what we called it, and you would just, you know, buzz, or as one of my former attendings says, buzz the heck out of it. Um, and there's a fallope ring here. These are Escher coils, and this is um, the Filshi clip uh, apparatus. And then this is kind of a uh, way that I used to do it, where you would just cut out a small segment of the tube and doubly tie each end. But again, most of these have kind of, and I guess I shouldn't speak for most of the world. I just know what we do at Sinai. There may be a lot of doctors in the US who still use some of these ways. 
Um, and they're all pretty good. It's just that, you know, their failure rate when you look at the number is a little bit higher in those like, <clears throat> you know, the banding or, you know, the uh, using a bipolar electrocautery or you, they used to have these spring clips. I don't even have a picture of that, but um, I saw it once and um, it was very difficult to get placed. Um, but the failure rate's very low overall. It's just, um, you know, if you can do something that's better and that's, you know, more effective, then why not? The other argument is, you know, a lot of these leave a foreign body inside and, you know, it's clearly it's permanent um, unless somebody does surgery to remove it. So I always kind of pause if there's a way I can do it without leaving anything that doesn't belong in the body and it works well. That's always my kind of default. So you, you guys know that Esher kind of went, um, went away in September 2015. You know, they had a big meeting. There was way more complaints that were ever reported during the clinical trials. And so because of that, you know, with these the symptoms of pain, you know, heavier bleeding or bleeding irregularities, um, headache, fatigue, weight changes. And, and one could argue that these may not have been due to the Esher, but, you know, it's just so hard to prove with these things. Um, I've taken a handful of these out and I've had most of those patients have said their symptoms have resolved. So I don't know if that's just placebo or if it actually was having a effect, but nonetheless, we don't do this anymore. The FDA took it off the market and it's no longer available um, in this country. So you don't have to remember too much about that. So when we talk about permanent birth control, of course we know there's risks, um, risks of anesthesia, risks of surgery in general, like bleeding, infection, injury to organs, risk of failure, certainly risk of regret. And I think this is the biggest one to you know, keep in the back of your brain. I think the, um, what was it called? The Choice Project, that was the one where they had the highest risk of regret was in, um, young women younger than 29 who were either African-American or Hispanic had um, very high regret rate at the um, conclusion of the study up to like, I think 25% or something. So I think, you know, that's really the most important thing to pause on and, and, you know, you never can tell. I mean, I, unfortunately, I saw a phone call that popped through my box the other day that I did a tubal on someone two years ago who was like 28, and this was her third baby, and she was certain, and now she's calling to say, like, when can I get my tubes untied? And as much as I thought I did a very thorough job of counseling, I'm not sure I could have done anything differently, but, you know, even still, there's a small, small chance of, of regret. So, so really, really test patients in your counseling. And I mean, I even talk about really sad things, you know, like I pose the question, if I feel they're a little bit on the fence, you know, like what if one of your babies passed away? What if, you know, gosh forbid your partner died and you found a new partner, would any of those things make you reconsider wanting to have another child? And if the answer is clearly no, 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 then, you know, I think you can feel pretty confident. So vasectomy, I know um, we don't treat men, but certainly, you know, this is a picture of how they do it. They inject a little numbing medicine on the scrotum. They find, you know, the um, vas deferens and they, you know, remove part of it and the ends are sealed. And uh, it's very effective. It's 30 times less likely to fail when you compare it to some of those older methods. That probably is a little bit lower now with the bilateral self-injectomy. <clears throat> um, but the big point that I always tell women is it's 20 times safer. They have such a low, low risk of complication when you think of how the process is done for this versus a tubal ligation. And, you know, in general, when I've talked to some of the urologists, they're like, yeah, I do it in like 10 or 20 minutes under local. So it's really fast. They don't have to miss work. Um, the problem is it doesn't act immediately like a tubal ligation does. They probably have to wait about three months um, or so many ejaculations. I don't know the exact number. And then they need to have negative sperm counts on some tests, kind of like how women used to have to come back for the HSG with Esher. It's a little bit more work to do. You can't just do it and then it's done. 
but still for you know the risks that you could potentially um, save a woman from I think it's absolutely um, worthwhile to discuss. All right, any questions? I'm going to bump into kind of some of the second tier contraception. Do I, how much time do I have left? No, 11, I think. Oh, cool. 10.40. Oh, perfect. Okay, I'll have plenty of time. I, uh, I know this lecture is a long one. It's probably, you know, contraception is very important and very detailed, um, even though sometimes it feels like when we're talking to the patients, like nothing will work for them. Um, so these are all the pills, patch, rings that we're going to talk about, and I'll kind of just go through each one. So combined hormonal contraception, um, really that means, you know, as we kind of know, there are, you know, so many different types of birth control pills. So you know, I always try and pause with the patient when they say, oh, I tried pills, they didn't work for me. And, you know, then I kind of talk to them about, you know, which type you had, because certainly the different progesterones in them, the different dose of estrogen, you know, can be um, variable in how women tolerate that. But pretty much the main mechanism is it inhibits, uh, inhibits ovulation. What I usually tell women is that you know, it kind of tricks your body into thinking it's pregnant because it keeps that estrogen and whatever progesterone you're using at a somewhat steady state higher level. So that, you know, tricks your ovaries into thinking, oh, I don't need to ovulate. Um, and it also thickens the mucus and makes the lining a little bit unfavorable. Really, you know, all these um, uh, options can be considered except for you know, these contraindications, and, and many of these were similar to being on that um, wheel that I showed you earlier. You know, certainly pregnancy, we're not using it, uncontrolled hypertension, smokers older than 35, any of these significant coronary or cardiovascular disorders, arrhythmias. Um, one thing that I think um, comes up, and I always kind of harp on you guys about asking migraines with aura. Um, the, the, the smoking, most people get the history of a DVT or a stroke, most people get um, hypertension, you know, most people get, but this one I think is forgotten about sometimes. And there was a study published in the Green Journal about two years ago that surveyed uh, family practice doctors and general practitioners who, who identified that they prescribed birth control. And that was the most common reason um, of, of prescribing a combined hormonal option when it should have been contraindicated was with the migraines with aura. Uh, in similar vein, and I've probably told you guys this as well in clinic, whenever somebody comes in on a birth control pill that I've never seen, I always do this screening all over again because I don't know if the other person asked them. And I picked up a few people in my years here that were, were on a hormonal contraception that they shouldn't have been on or that it would have been more risky for them to be on and, you know, have been able to come up with reasonable, safer alternatives. All right, let's see here. So the range of um, estrogen or ethanyl estradiol can be anywhere from 10 to 50 micrograms. Really, I don't think there's hardly any, if any at all, that are higher than 50 micrograms these days. And the Many, many years ago, they used to use doses that were higher because they thought that's what was needed to actually have them work and inhibit ovulation. The 10 microgram comes in this pill called low, low estrin, which is um, low estrin is 20 micrograms and low, low estrin is the, is the lowest dose that I know of for, for contraception. The problem with it is it's not usually covered by insurance because the 20 microgram version is way cheaper and works just as well. And probably the side effect profile isn't that much different. Um, but, you know, certainly that is something you can think about. And then <clears throat> the progestin dose could be monophasic, meaning it's the same amount throughout, biphasic, meaning it changes, you know, partway through, and triphasic means it changes three times with the amount. They used to try and mimic the actual cycle of a woman, but I'll be honest, I don't, I don't really use many of the biphasic or triphasic ones. I typically just stick to the monophasic myself. Um, I don't know what my partners do, but my go-to is typically low estrin. And if they don't tolerate that or they have some bleeding issues with it, 
then I bump it up uh, to a 35 microgram uh, ethanol estradiol type. So let's see here. Oh, I always like to review this slide just to remind you guys that, um, and this isn't, I don't think this is all inclusive, but you can see here that there's varying levels of activity, um, and this is androgenic activity. So when we talk about things like levonorgestrel or norgestrel, that's got a pretty high level of androgenic activity, um, which is why some women don't want that. Um, norethindrone is probably the most common one in birth control pills. That's kind of middle of the road. And then most of us have heard of drospirinone um, or norgestimate. Those have the lowest um, androgenic activity. So just something to think about. If one pill doesn't work, and you're thinking about changing them, then you know, kind of keep these um, in the back of your brain to think, oh, maybe I should try one from a little bit of a different androgenic profile. And then benefits, you know, most of you guys have a template, but you know, the, the big benefits are typically, you know, it, it regulates a woman's cycle, reduces the menstrual flow, and uh, for a lot of women can improve dysmenorrhea, whether from endometriosis or just from someone who has painful menses. There are other benefits that are kind of more long-term with regards to protection against um, endometrial or ovarian cancer. Um, benign breast disease can be reduced. Certainly it can improve some, some hirsutism or acne for some women um, because really what it does is it, um, lowers the free testosterone in the body. So, you know, you kind of get that benefit from that, which is why it's used a lot for women with um, uh, PCOS. And then, um, yeah, I think those are kind of the big things with regards to that. So how to start birth control pills. So there's a couple of different ways. You can wait till the first day of the period. You can uh, do this um, so-called Sunday start so that way you know it's at an easy day during the week for them to remember or you can do quick start which is where they just start it whenever you um, you know prescribe it for them um, typically you know if you use that quick start they should use some sort of backup method for at least a week to ensure that they don't get pregnant in the meantime because um, as we know birth control pills it's not like you take it and they start being 100 percent effective right away. I think anyway is fine. They might have some more irregular bleeding patterns if you do it kind of in the middle of their otherwise normal cycle. But, um, but aside from that, I think it's generally very well tolerated. The other thing that comes up quite often is, you know, what to do when women miss a pill. So typically if they, um, <clears throat> if they miss it, and it's not like this really low, low estrogen dose, but maybe one of the more medium um, doses of estrogen, then, you know, if they miss the pill and it's only a few hours, they should just take it and then, you know, start again the next day when they otherwise would have normally taken it. If they miss it and it's been, you know, a whole 24 hours, they're supposed to double up. So take the pill they missed from the day before and then the pill that's supposed to be taken that day. And then it should still be fine in general. But if they miss any more than two doses, what I tell them is they need to probably throw out that pack, start a new pack and use backup for um, seven days. So what about the patch? This is called ortho evra. Um, I mean, this picture shows them putting it on their back. Um, you can put it on, you know, anywhere pretty much, buttocks, outer arm, lower abdomen, upper torso, and um, you change it every week for three weeks. And at the end of the third week, you have them go patch free and that's when they would typically have their cycle. Um, you know, the problem with this is, you know, it's summer, if people sweat, if people use suntan lotion. Um, I've had a lot of patients who try it and say, oh, it just, it wouldn't stay on. So that always makes me a little leery, but for some women it works really well and I think it's an option. You know, the, the big thing to remember is that I think um, for this and also for the next one on, you know, these have only been studied in, in, in patients probably up to about 90 kilograms or so. So it's not that women who weigh more than that can't use it. It's just we just 
probably have to counsel them that it might not be as effective and they may have an increased risk for pregnancy compared to someone who doesn't weigh that much, but certainly um, certainly is a reasonable option. If that's the only one they want, it's better than nothing. The other thing is with the patch, they have a slightly increased risk for venous thromboembolism. Um, and that's mostly because the, the exposure uh, to estrogen is a little bit higher um, because they avoid the first pass metabolism in the liver, unlike when people ingest a pill. So another thing to just kind of keep in mind um, if you're on the fence about this or, or you know, pills. And then NuvaRing is um, very similar. It has estrogen and progesterone. The, the downside with this is it has to be refrigerated. Shelf life is probably only about four months. So, you know, if they have one in the fridge for six months, nine months a year, you know, I, I am not, I'm not sure that the manufacturers would say that it's going to work as well. But the really nice thing about this is you place it in the vaginal area for three weeks and then they just leave it in place. And then at the end of the third week, they remove it. And again, similar to the patch, they have their menses. Now, typically it's not recommended to remove it for, um, for sexual intercourse, but if it does, I guess the manufacturers and the, the, the best data that I could find says it has to be replaced within at least three hours if it falls out or it's removed for intercourse. But I would say, ideally, it just stays in place for that whole three weeks. And then this is a little bit new information uh, compared to um, uh, pr previous lectures. There's a new transvaginal ring called Anovira. And um, again, it's, it's probably only been out less than a year or so. The big um, change with this is unlike the Nuva ring, which you have to get a little, it's kind of a little packet and you kind of tear open that packet and you get one ring, you, you know, every month. This ring is more like a, almost like a pessary in the sense that it's um, a tad bit bigger and they have more medicine in it. Um, and the medicine is this um, suggesterone acetate along with ethanyl estradiol. You can actually use it for not sued. Oops, sorry. <laughs> you can get sued if you prescribe it to someone who's had a DVT or a PE or a stroke. So just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, it can be used for 12 months. So, um, so you know, how it works is you um, place it vaginally for three weeks, you remove it for a week. And then you take it out, you wash it, and they give you a little compact case to store it in for seven days. The big change is this, this one doesn't need to be refrigerated. At least that's what the papers that I read said. And so really it's, it's a lot more convenient because I mean, you could literally prescribe this to someone, they could be traveling overseas or wherever, not clearly now, but in the future, hopefully. <laughs> Um, and, you know, for that reason, it's really convenient that they don't have to get a new one from a pharmacy every month. Um, the failure rate was quite low at two to four per 100 women. And again, they did these open label clinical trials with women in the standard age range from 18 to 40. So really certainly something that I have not prescribed yet, but if someone was interested in it, I wouldn't hesitate to discuss it and, and and I don't know how cost is, I don't know what insurance is like, but certainly um, that would be up and coming information to learn about. So keep that one in the back of your mind. Um, with regards to kind of bumping back to extended cycle contraception. So this is any of the hormonal contraceptive methods that are combined. So the patch, the ring, pills, um, you can use these for more than the kind of standard 21 or 28 days of active pills. Um, you know, certainly this does allow women to kind of manipulate your cycles. For women with endometriosis, it's really beneficial because they typically tend to have most of their pain when they're having their periods. So, you know, whether they don't have a period for three months or six months or even a whole year, you know, this can really be beneficial for some women. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that happens for some women and, and what you might expect is that if you continue to use it continuously, a lot of women will stop having periods. And so for some women that can again be nerve wracking. So that'd be one of the downsides of, um, 
you know, doing that, but their kind of headaches, bloating, fatigue, dysmenorrhea can all be significantly reduced with extended cycle contraception. So I, I just want to talk a little bit about drug interactions, and then we're getting almost to the end here. Um, so typically, when we think about birth control pills, you know, sometimes you'll get these messages like, oh, my doctor put me on amoxicillin, um, and they told me to call you about my birth control and see if it's still working. So in general, most antibiotics should be okay. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on the few that are not. So in this slide, this is saying that birth control pill decreases the effectiveness of these drugs. So seizure medications like lamotrigine, benzos, um, uh, st steroid medicines, you know, this may decrease how well those medicines work. So certainly if a woman is on lamotrigine for seizure disorder, this is a discussion that needs to be had about potentially considering something else. Um, Theophylline's not used that much. Sometimes people are on it rarely for like COPD, but most of those women are typically out of contraception years. <laughs> With regards to reducing the effectiveness of birth control, so really, you know, rifampin, which is typically treated for TB, um, gris, I don't even know how to pronounce that, but whatever this is, is for... Um, I think typically like a fungal infection. Um, phenytoin and carbamazepine are certainly um, used for seizure disorders and antiretrovirals for HIV. So these medications, if a woman are on them, can reduce how well a birth control pill works. So really important for these medications, if they're on these, to keep that in mind and potentially consider something else. Or if someone gets TB, and they're started on rifampin, you know, really important to talk to them about this because they may not have full protection from pregnancy. So let's see here. Um, diabetes, you know, certainly um, higher doses of birth control pills can be insulin antagonists, so they might worsen their diabetes with that. Low doses are probably okay. Um, Cardiovascular disease again, if they're if they have like the type of uh, hypertension where we look back and they've had like two abnormals, but all the rest are normal. You know, these are the women where it still may be somewhat um, applicable to using a combined hormonal contraception if if they're not on meds and it's otherwise well controlled and this is what they really want. I would absolutely have them come back within a couple months to get a blood pressure check or you know, give them a blood pressure cuff at home because there are a small proportion of women who can get worsening hypertension on these medications. And then certainly just remember history of stroke, migraines with aura, they definitely should not be on these medications. Two to four uh, times the risk of a stroke with migraines with aura. Somet sometimes what comes up is you, you talk to them about the risk of of DVT with birth control pills. And you know, that absolute risk is actually really small. Without any type of birth control, it's one in 10,000. With combined hormonal, it's about three to four per 10,000. With pregnancy, it's about five to six per 10,000. So I always tell them, you know, the risk is smaller than if you were to get pregnant, but only slightly higher than, you know, women who aren't using any type of birth control. So this risk is pretty darn small. And then um, the risk of um, hepatic neoplasia and focal nodular hyperplasia, this is more so linked to the really high dose combined hormonal contraception, not really affiliated with low dose ones. Doesn't come up that often. And again, cervical dysplasia, there's some studies showing that, you know, the increased risk of dysplasia and cancer with women who had used birth control pills you know, I think it's not due to the pills themselves. It's probably due to women using less barrier, more frequently getting HPV or more frequently getting, you know, persistence of HPV as opposed to birth control pills causing this cervical dysplasia risk. And then breast cancer is always a hot topic. You know, there's lots of literature. Some studies are really good. Some studies are really poorly done, but showed a risk of breast cancer and birth control pills. I would say there's no real strong evidence that links women who used combined hormonal contraception, their risk of getting breast cancer in the future. 
um, it does, again, lower the risk of benign breast disease for these women. Um, progestin only pills, Micronor is the most common one. There's a new one out, which I'll talk a little bit about. As we all know, this one, it's very, very important to take at the same time every day, given it acts by thickening that mucus and, and altering the endometrium by thinning it. It does not reliably inhibit ovulation, unlike combined hormonal contraception. So that's why it's really important to, to stress the exact same time every day. And the contraindications are very similar to what we saw in like the IUDs, um, aside from the things like PID, um, abnormal bleeding, breast cancer, it's still frowned upon, hepatic neoplasms, pregnancy, acute liver disease. Um, you should pause if you're going to prescribe these. So this is the new one that um, is on the market called SLIND. Um, it is made of the progesterone drosperinone and... You know, the, the, the drosperinone kind of got a bad rap um, because it was in the um, uh, Yaz birth control pill, which, which came out with that, you know, FDA warning that it had a higher risk of VTE incidence compared to other types of birth controls. So that's why we don't use Yaz quite as often. I think it's still good in a select patient population like women who have PCOS with hirsutism but you definitely need to counsel them on that risk. Um, you know, because this doesn't have estrogen in it, um, the dose is higher, so it's four milligrams. I can't remember what the dose is exactly in, in Yaz, but it's higher than that. And what they do is they take 24 of these four milligram tablets, then they have kind of like the rest of the month off until the new one. And with ideal use so far, it's shown about a 4% failure rate. Again, this assumes they take it at the exact same time every day. They don't miss any doses, uh, but it's still relatively new. So there's really not long-term data, but certainly if someone is looking for a progestin only pill, this could be one to consider. And those are kind of the two newest ones that, that year long ring and this progesterone only pill called SLIN. Have you heard about that Fexi? Which one's that? There's this new thing called Fexi. It's a gel that's coming out in September. Oh, no, I didn't hear about that probably because it didn't come out yet, huh? Yeah, it's FDA approved now. It's coming out in September and it's like a gel that you use and it changes the pH. And they're also doing studies to see about it preventing gonorrhea and chlamydia, which is interesting. Oh, cool. Well, maybe whatever soul gets to do your lecture next year or i can maybe come back and make a camera come back yeah, yeah. <laughs> um I'll, I'll definitely have it in there once i read about it oh yeah look at this flexit.com all right i'll read about it oh wait no this is another uh, it's p h i think e x x i okay that's why i can't find it <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so disadvantages, um, you know, clearly, like I said, if they miss pills, even if it's four hours late, they should probably use a backup method for a couple of days because the effectiveness just drops off. Um, some women have irregular bleeding and there is some data to show maybe they could get um, benign functional cysts. Again, not any type of worry for malignancy or anything, but certainly, as we know, those cysts <clears throat> can sometimes cause quite a debacle if they're ruptured or, you know, uh, hemorrhagic. Um, I'll spend just a little bit of time on depo and then we're almost done here. Um, so as we know, I, I think they were even thinking about trying to come up with a new um, longer acting injection. But as of now, I don't think there's anything out on the market. So typically it's 12 weeks between injections. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of downfalls with this um, they has a high discontinuation rate normally due to the irregular bleeding that a lot of women experience. However, like I tell patients, if you stick with it, there are a lot of women who stop having periods and a lot of women like that aspect. Um, but it definitely has delayed return to fertility. If you use it for many years, it can reduce the strength of your bone density, although that's reversible once you stop it. Um, and you know, the big thing is for some women, I tell them, even if you get a few shots of this, 
you know, your, your return to ovulation may be 12, even as up to as much as 18 months for some women. So it's definitely not a good short-term solution for women who say, oh, I just want to use something for a bit and then try and get pregnant right away. Um, so that's kind of it for Depo. I know there's probably other contraindications um, that you can read about or side effects, but I'm getting to the end here. So I just want to kind of move through this. Barrier methods, as you know, there's male condom, female condom. Uh, some people use the um, uh, a sponge, um, diaphragm, um, and then fertility awareness. So typically, like I said, these, these um, have a pretty high failure rate, but um, certainly um, can be used if nothing else. Spermicide, from what I read, usually only lasts about two hours. So it certainly should be used very close around the time of um, coitus. And then really, you know, for women who have regular cycles, you know, obviously they typically tend to ovulate on day 14 and sperm lives for about 72 hours. So, you know, typically if they avoid intercourse from those days, like eight to 19 of their cycle and, and they, you know, have a regular cycle, that probably is a fairly reasonable chance they won't get pregnant. But as we all know, the body sometimes does whatever it wants to. And so therefore it's probably not that reliable. And then fourth tier contraception, um, again, these are just all these kind of like uh, vaginal film, the sponge, sorry, I think, I think I said the sponge earlier, but the sponge, the spermicides and um, um, vaginal uh, lubricants that can sometimes be utilized. I will be honest, I've never prescribed these, <clears throat> um, not because I'm against it, just because no one's ever asked. So emergency contraception, so plan B is typically what we use, although there's also um, ulipristil or Ella, um, mifepristone, but that's a little bit challenging to get. Um, the USP method um, or USEPI is taking different formulations of a lot of combined hormonal pills to get to the dose that you need, but that is you know, has tons of side effects and a lot of women vomit them out because the estrogen gets so high when you're just taking these multiple pills. Um, this is best clearly to use immediately after intercourse, but even up to um, five days after intercourse can be used, although the effectiveness wears off the um, longer or further away you get from the act of intercourse. Um, so the IUD, like I was saying, it's best when it's used within 72 hours after unprotected intercourse, and that will prevent over 95% of unexpected or undesired pregnancies. Ulipristal is about 66%, and levonorgestrel prevents around 50% of pregnancies if you use it um, within 72 hours. But that's higher for Plan B if you take it soon, soon after. These are kind of at the the worst case scenario of how well they'll work if you take it right at the end of the kind of farthest out you can get from, from unprotected intercourse. And then male contraception. So uh, this is this new gel for, um, or sorry, not new, but um, this is a gel for men <laughs> that um, is not FDA approved, but it's, it can be injected into the vas deferens and apparently in the people or the studies that I've read that are small, that have used it in other countries, it can last up to 13 years, but um, this definitely needs more um, research. And then this male, um, male birth control pill, which is called DMAU, if you Google it, is, I think this one is being developed in India but it, it has passed safety tests. It definitely reduces the sperm count, but it doesn't put it to zero like a vasectomy eventually does. It's not FDA approved. There's still some research, but at least there's some promising things here that you know may, may put more of this responsibility on the male partner. Okay, that's it. Questions at all? Questions, family <laughs> friends. Going back to um, endometritis and IUDs, yes, is a test of, is a negative test of cure sufficient? Because my the data the 
the wording is endometritis, not necessarily gonorrhea, strict. Yeah, so I, I, I do, I think if they have a negative test of cure and or their symptoms are all gone, you know, by three months, then I feel totally fine. If they had endometritis not from an STD, I kind of do the same thing. I, I say, let's use something else for a few months. Once your symptoms have resolved, then we can readdress this. Um, but they, they feel better it. after a month with a negative test of cure. I still wait the three months just because of this data, and I try and get them on something else. Um, what each of you chooses to do in your practice once you're on your own is totally reasonable. Um, I think, and my partners may even differ from me, I'm just not sure. Most of the people that I talk to in my group when we talk about this wait the full three months. Um, but again, you could argue if you have a patient who's got like a history of six terminations, doesn't want anything else, she, her test of cure is negative and she's asymptomatic after a month, then I think again, that's where you use your clinical judgment to decide those risks and benefits. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Dorton. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'll see some of you guys in clinic later. Thank you.